Hi, everybody. It's Craig Diamond. We have a new episode of Diamond's Corner. And today we have a very, very special guest. His name is Alex Coriano. Um, we'll get to know him. We'll get to know about his background, his wrestling days, his days of design. He's going to walk us through an amazing career in, in all aspects. So um stay tuned hope you enjoy and everyone uh, say hi to alex coriano hey what's up everybody how you doing thanks for joining us um so you know a little bit of background alex is a part of the team if, if anybody out there is wearing any diamond mma products compression briefs compression jocks you've got this man uh to thank as we both were um kind of designing and building this company together for for years now and start us from the beginning alex T tell everybody who you are where you grew up and, and and kind of walk us through the life of uh of you yeah sure quick background information stories is that i grew up in northwest indiana right outside chicago so i consider myself a chicago guy but i'm actually from the state of indiana i was uh big into sports growing up played a lot of baseball football soccer um and then wrestling and wrestling really kind of caught my attention and I, I did really well i took second in the state of indiana and got recruited to go to purdue university for for wrestling which was let me yeah. sorry let me slow you down because there's i i know there's some good good th nuggets in here what how old were when you started wrestling i was uh 11 years old like 10 11 i was in middle school and uh my how'd you get into it what season, you know, I was going to soccer practice and uh, I would wrestle around with the guys at soccer practice who were actually wrestling uh, and they had older brothers that wrestled and they were, they would throw me around. I didn't like it. They would throw me around and I, I was like, how did you do that? How did you just take me, you know, take me down so easily? So I, I kept asking them, can you, can you show me some moves? And I was just really interested in that as well as I was really into the WWF at the time. So before it was WWE, it was WWF and I was like big at the yep. Jimmy Superfly, you know, Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant. And uh, I would watch that and I would jump off my sofas and beat up my little brother. And uh, so there was something that was kind of calling me towards this like more physical aggressive kind of sport at, that, that wrestling is. Cool. What, so walk us through your, a little bit about through your high school career. And then how did you, how did you get to wrestle for Purdue? I mean, how did that all go down? Yeah, so, you know, I, I worked really hard at wrestling. I, I always felt like it's one of those sports that how hard you put in, the work you put into it is, is you, you get that in benefit, right, in return. You know, where other sports you could try really hard, you could be the best on the team and go four for four for four home runs and still lose. Where wrestling was like, that was your control. And I kind of like that feeling of, um, you know, I work hard, I want the benefits of that. And when I lose, there's no one else to blame except myself. So, that, that that whole discipline of, of being um, just dedicated and, and wanting to learn, it really captivated me. That, that sport really drove me. And I did well in high school. You know, I put in a lot of time. I, I did summer camps. Um, I did freestyle season in the spring. And I, you know, I wrestled and I, I did everything right. I was cutting weight. I was uh, working out. I was, I was, you know, staying after practice. And I, so uh, I went from like, getting thrown around those first couple of years to uh, winning a lot of tournaments in high school. And I, I ended up going to the state tournament twice and I got second my senior year. And that got me a little bit of attention from the, the schools, the local schools um, being in the state of Indiana. I, I was recruited by a bunch of the division one, two and three schools in the area. And I went on a couple of recruit trips and I just loved uh, the campus at Purdue and what they had to offer. And at the time they were a top 10 team and, um, so I knew that I had a good future there at Purdue. Now, did you, so did you, did you walk on? Is that what I remember you saying once? Did you, were you at a scholarship? How did you? Uh, yeah, well, technically I did not get a scholarship. I was recruited, but um, because I didn't get any money to, to wrestle for the school, I was considered a walk on, which, um, you know, to me was, I felt like I was always part of the team being recruited. And I showed up on day one, I had my, my workout gear and I was on the roster. Uh, interesting thing though, I was still 17. I was really young when I was in high school. So going to college, I had 
to sign off that I could be on the wrestling team at Purdue because I wasn't an adult yet at 18. Oh, that's uh, funny. Uh, but uh, I loved it, man. The, the team really was great. They really embraced um, just having me on the team. And, you know, again, it was one of those things where I got my butt kicked every day. But, but I just kept, you know, sticking with the grind, keep working hard, uh, learn as much technique as I can, always making sure I was in shape and on weight. And, uh, and when I got my turn, um, you know, I redshirted my freshman year. I needed to get a little bit stronger. So I was, that's when I really started lifting weights and getting strong. So uh, my senior year in high school, I was 125. And I wrestled a couple bouts at 126 in college. But I was growing still. You know, I was 17. So um, I, I bulked up 134. <laughs> um, they had the old weight classes back then, the old college weight classes. Um, and I ended up um, making the varsity team and uh, went to nationals my, my redshirt freshman year. And uh, so I got a varsity letterman's jacket. I thought that was super cool. Still wear it today. I yep. have it in my closet. Um, but yeah, I just, I love being part of that Purdue wrestling community, which I still keep in touch with a lot of guys. And, um, and, and it, what I, it was super intense because you're wrestling the Big Ten. The Big Ten is, is the premier conference for wrestling in the NCAA. And so it was, I lost a lot, believe me, I lost a lot. But I won a lot too, you know, and it was, it was a battle. Every match was going to be a tough match, tough opponent. Um, but I, I just love the, the training and the grind, you know, that goes behind that. It's a long season and you get kind of burned out towards the end. But, you know, you, if you make it through college wrestling, um, that's, and I think that's why that fraternity of wrestlers are so, uh, it's such a brotherhood because, you know, you've been through that, that ringer, through that grind and, and you start to really yep. appreciate each other for who you are and, and what you can do. And it really shows your character. And so I was able to, to maintain that um, and make the varsity for all four years at Purdue went to nationals three times was the captain twice uh, set a record for school wins in a season. And so, yeah, I, was, wow. I, I would say I didn't accomplish all my goals. You know, I wasn't a national champion, but I, I actually uh, felt like I, accomplished a lot looking back and and most importantly it was those relationships you know those people I met and and get me through school and and it was a great experience for me on and off the mat at Purdue. Did that's amazing I mean so tell me about tell tell the viewers about I mean you're wrestling you say you didn't really accomplish all the things you wanted to accomplish um but I think for me personally, it's really cool that you took your wrestling now to the next level in the form of, of MMA. So tell us a little bit about after school was done and, and, you know, the collegiate wrestling days were over. Tell us about moving to the Bay area and how you used your wrestling to help some of the baddest MMA fighters in the world. And, and, and to tell about that transition. I think that's interesting. Yeah, well, um, actually, I wasn't done wrestling. I, I felt like I still had more to prove, and I was still learning a lot. And uh, I was still young. So I, after college, I, I felt like there was more for me on the international stage. And there was a, so I really was trying to take it to the next level for myself and, and really see how far I can, I can go with this sport of wrestling. So I ended up wrestling for the team of Puerto Rico. I, I actually was on a vacation brought my wrestling shoes. I was still training, doing some tournaments, the U S open. And, uh, I, I knew of some guys on the Puerto Rican national team and they said, Hey, and I, I was talking with the coach. He said, if you stay here because you're Puerto Rican descent, you can stay here and live and train and represent Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and we have a couple of tournaments coming up, one in Cuba. Um, there was the central American games, a few other tournaments international tournaments i was like oh that sounds awesome so i canceled my va my vacation my flight back and i just stayed and i trained i lived with my grandma out there and i lived with the family and i was I got a little job i was training every day uh with the national team going to the olympic training center there and i won the nationals for puerto rico and i ended up doing that for four years so i wrestled freestyle international uh representing puerto rico which is great uh, again it was a great experience of the people i met places i got to go travel see uh, different parts of the country that really appreciate wrestling and um and that that helped me become even better you know and so again i kind of fell short of making the olympics in 2000 and i was living in chicago at the time and i was training a little bit at northwestern helping out there and uh, I, I had a job designing toys because i was also uh, doing a lot of design work and um 
then uh, an opportunity came to move to California and I always felt like California was calling me. There's something about, you know, just the land here and the people and the technology. I felt like, oh, this is, this would be a good spot for me to land and, and figure out my next steps in my life while yep. living here. So I packed up my car, drove to, drove to uh, all the way across country to California. I was living with some friends on the couch and got a good design job. And, and uh, that this company was based right by Stanford. So Again, I, I just wrestling's always been such a part of my life. I started helping out at Stanford and coaching wrestling and helping. It was everybody from like some college students or high school students and some MMA fighters would come in there, jujitsu guys wanting to learn takedowns. So I would teach them moves. And so I would coach the team, the, the, the varsity team, and then stay after and then do the club team. And uh, I met a couple guys that were training. They me to come over and learn some jiu-jitsu and i felt like hey this is this is pretty cool jiu-jitsu is an extension of wrestling so now i can take you down put you on your back but now i can take it even further and finish you you know make you tap out so i felt like the rest, it was a natural transition into doing some jiu-jitsu did a couple tournaments um but really i just just captivated by the 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 athletes that are in that sport and how hard they work and how dedicated they are and passionate they are you know no one's having them do this they're doing this because they want to do this so the intensity is there the, the commitment's there and so I love working out with the the MMA fighters they push me you know when they got fights coming up it makes me want to work harder cool who are some of the guys you work out with so like, one of the guys I met at the Stanford wrestling room was Josh Klomp and he was in uh, UFC for a few years and he's one of the head coaches a black belt trainer at El Nino and he brought me into El Nino which El Nino training center is El Nino is the nickname for Gilbert Melendez and so at the time Gilbert was climbing the ladder he was strike force champion he was, I think even ranked number one in the world he was a pretty intense guy to work out with and it was fun rolling around with him and Josh and and Jake Shields would be there and, and, and other guys, you know, then the Diaz brothers would show up sometimes. And uh, it was a small room that they had over in uh, kind of the bad part of town. And, uh, but then they got a, a new gym uh, a big, and uh, started, you know, it really mixing up the, the disciplines. You know, they had some Muay Thai there before, but bigger space, like a full size ring and the bags and they have all kinds of classes there. So I helped coach the wrestling class there with Travis Lee. We do a takedown wrestling class. Um, and then I also do a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions with the fighters and we do a lot of drilling these days. I do a lot of drilling, like hard live drilling, put them through different scenarios um, and, and show them kind of what, how I would attack a, a certain position as a wrestler. Cause a lot of times these fighters are fighting other people with wrestling backgrounds. So I'm a good body for that. I can give them different looks and, and have them um, react to, you know, how I would potentially attack you know, uh, a shot or defend a shot. That's nice. I mean, <clears throat> that's going to keep you in shape. And how far is the gym from your house? And where are you, where are you living now? Tell everybody. So I, yeah, I live in Brisbane, which is just on the border of San Francisco. So, and the gym is in the dog patch. And um, like I said, there's, I'm not sure how many members, but it's a, it's a, pretty big sized gym for MMA. I believe it's like uh, one of the premier gyms in the whole Bay area. Um, and uh, a lot of good fighters coming through there. The, the, the fight team's called the scrap pack and those guys get out there and there's a lot of guys competing um, in MMA, but also in jujitsu, grappling tournaments, uh, Muay Thai fights. So it's a very active gym. It's, it's, it's uh, you can come in there and train if you just want to learn about the sport, but you can also come there and train and actually get some comp competitive rounds in that are going to get you prepared for a, a real fight. Yeah, and you know, so those guys, uh, you know, Gill and um, Clompton and, and a lot of those earlier guys, you know, when, when we first hooked up and started working together and designing products together, were huge for us to try out our prototypes on. So that was it. That was, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, kind of human centered design and, and how we applied some of the design skills you learned in, in college to solving this problem in MMA. And, 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 you know, just, I think that might be interesting. Yeah. So when I was at Purdue, I studied industrial design 
And mm -hmm. what I always like to say, like des industrial design was like engineering and art and you blend those two, right? So it has to look aesthetically pleasing and have functionality, but able to, to work and be able to be produced, manufactured. So um, I learned a lot of skills at school. I, I did a toy invention when I was living in Chicago. And then I moved out here and got a job with a company called IDEO and they do a lot of human centered design. And I was working first in the toy industry. Then I was working with medical devices and home electronics and food and beverage and packaging. So a, a wide gamut of projects and products. And I always had a passion for sports. So when I met you, it was only natural that I, I was drawn towards uh, the opportunity to be able to design products for MMA fighters or grapplers or wrestlers or for anybody in combat sports. Um, because I was already practicing those things, those kind of sports, but also have the skill set of design where I can bring an idea to life. So if you have an idea, I can build to prototypes and test these with some of the fighters. So that exactly what happened was, um, yeah, we met and you said, we want to, let's, let's design something that not only we had to pay our fighters to wear our product, but something they were going to want to pay us to wear. And I thought that was kind of a good mission. Like what is, what product do they need? And we started off trying to design shorts and gloves and other products, but through talking with all these fighters and being in the gym with them, we realized, hey, the, the biggest complaint was the inadequate groin protection that was going on, right? People were wearing these, it's mandatory to wear a mouthpiece and a cup. So athletic cup were basically made for baseball or they were wearing these jock straps where things would move around and, uh, or they had to wear like three pairs of shorts, underwear, Pair yep. of tight and a jock strap over the underneath their actual fight short. So they were like too many layers and uh, causing some discomfort. So, you know, I think you had the, the original idea, like this all in one fight short. And then from there we started. Um, so real quick, I just want to explain what human centered design is just to back up a second. What, what, how would you define that? Yeah, human centered design, you want to look at the end user. So whatever product you're designing or service or space, you want to make sure that you're connecting with the end user with, and in most cases, the end user is a human, right? Sometimes it could be a pet or a, an animal or something some, or a robot even, but the end user, um, it usually is a human and you want to design for them what their, their unmet needs are. So if they're having a problem keeping that cup in place, athletic cup in place, let's talk to them and figure out, you know, what are those needs and how do you address those problems? And once you can identify those problems, then you can de develop solutions for them. So that's, that's kind of what you taught me about. And I, I kind of was fortunate enough to, to come out actually to that very shed that you're sitting in right now is where we really had our first meeting. Um, and uh, we sat down and, and we had concept sketches, which actually we're going to show up we're going to kind of insert here really cool concept sketches of shorts. I remember shorts that look like Batman would wear and um, rodeo inspired shorts. And so all these cool concepts kind of boiled down to the need for the fighter. Like you said, we thought that the shorts would be something they really need, but when talking to them, they said, you know what, we, we really need a good cup. And there were tons of low blow groin shot timeouts in the UFC, certainly back in the early days. And the action would just stop because these guys weren't protected properly. So Alex and I, you know, we hooked up, we went on this mission, we were prototyping, we were designing and, you know, prototype after prototype and, and talking to the fighters and getting them to test our stuff um, was how we really perfected it. And that was just, such a cool part of the process for me, not only to meet these fighters who I looked up to and like to watch on TV, but to, you know, learn how to, to solve a problem and, and especially a problem in a sport that we loved not only participating in, but watching. So, um, yeah, that's, that's cool. We're going to, we're probably going to do a second show and go really in depth again of, how we came to the product what were some of the early prototypes what were some of the early cup prototypes how did we come up with the the a four strap four strap jock or the the performance short and and dive into that and i know you got bins and buckets up over your shoulder there with just many many just fabric samples and prototypes and yoga mats and duct taped product i mean 
the one thing I learned from Alex was if you, there it is. If you need, <laughs> if you want a product, if you want to design something and you have an idea, just get some popsicle sticks, some tape and, and just start hacking it together. And, and I, and, some of our first prototypes were such a crude, rough idea that just slowly got better. And the next day we make it a little bit better. And then we sketched another design. And, and, and um, so it was just an amazing process to, to work with Alex and, and, you know, solve a big problem for these athletes. Um, and yeah, so what would you say, Alex, in this whole mission? I mean, you've designed toys, you've designed products for every every industry what was something that you learned most from working together on this and, and and working on diamond mma and building this company with me that you didn't expect um i felt like i what i've learned a lot just working with you in particular is uh the whole sales and marketing like you you really put yourself out there you try a different different kind of just like we experiment and, and make rapid prototypes with physical objects to test and learn you do that with ideas too and um some of them i was not so sure about but then they turned out to be really fun you know like the, the whole cup check cup check challenge you know that's that's yeah nice um or some of the promotional items that you gave away like little squishy sperm balls <laughs> i was like what is this guy thinking but you know the, you're getting people's attention and you're really good at that and uh so it kind of opened my eyes to like how, how i need to be a better salesman you know like it, you know in, in design i'm trying to sell ideas and i've actually learned some of the strategies that you use in uh in, your your skill set and and that's thanks i'm a better presenter in, in a way you know thanks um, yeah no and and i've noticed too i mean we've worked trade shows together we were at ufc 100 uh we had a small little booth um we didn't we barely had product we had some working prototypes and um you've come a long way too is just getting out in front of the table and pitching people and and learning how to get rejected and have, have someone laugh in your face and say, get away. I mean, like, that's being a pitch man and, and, and getting your product out there, especially when it's something new and it's something different and it's something more expensive, but you know, how do you make someone understand, Oh, this is worth it. And, and you got, you know, you got to try this and it's been fun working with you and working with some of our other teammates and learning different skills from everybody. And that's kind of what makes a team is, everybody has a skill set and, and hopefully you can learn from all that. Um, so yeah, it's, it, you know, I'm glad we got this chance to talk. I, I, it's good to get a little bit of background for you uh, and, and your history, certainly your wrestling background. And um, you know, just to wrap it up, tell, tell us like where so you're living, tell us about your house. Tell us about your kids. Tell us about what, what else is it? What is I know we're in this COVID lockdown still. I mean, what, how have you been dealing with that? And what have you guys been up to? Well, um, you know, you mentioned earlier that uh, we were working in the shed. So as, as we talked about, this is my prototyping lab where I do a lot of my design work. So if I ever need to get away from anybody, if I need to like think, I come back here and I, I can build stuff. I have a lot of materials and, and stuff and a sewing machine and fabrics and things I can kind of tinker around with and have my music going and, um, so yeah, I, I have a I have a nice little house here, We're close to San Francisco, which is nice living in the Bay Area. Um, but I have some separation within my my property here with this uh, back step shed. And uh, uh, but yeah, man, I love living out in California. Um, still love being a, a designer and an athlete. And uh, now I'm trying to pass that on to my kids. I got two boys that are. 12 years old and nine years old and they're playing sports. So it's fun being on the field with them, coaching their soccer team, their baseball and their basketball team. Funny. I've never played basketball before, but now here I am learning more about that sport and it's a really great sport. And it's a really great time for me to bond with my, my kid and learn more about his friends and, and, uh, and bring some of that competitive competitiveness and training that I know from other sports into a sport like basketball. So I'm keeping busy with the kids. We don't try to get outside. We, we try to make sure we do some creative time every day. We try to do some academic time every day. Um, yeah, we've been eating and sleeping well during lockdown, but you know we're 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 missing our friends, and uh, can't wait to get back out there. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on. This was awesome. Um, we're gonna do a part two soon, so stay tuned for that. And then we're gonna and we're gonna do a deep dive into the real origins of um the, the design of all of our products and i think that'd be interesting for people that are 
are passionate about our stuff and wear our stuff to, to learn about. In closing, um, it was great talking to you. Um, I know, again, we got this quarantine going on and everybody's trying to stay busy and stay fit at home. Um, Alex, you were a huge um, you know, help and obviously design lead on our compression brief uh, shown here and um, our performance brief shown here. Uh, and, and, and those two products, tell me about some of the exercises that you've been doing wearing those products and, and what people could use them for at home. Yeah. You know, first of all, you know, we came up with a really great product with that four strap jock and that really keeps uh, the athletic cup in place, which is so important. And we've been able to evolve that into new products as the comp competition short um, and different vari variations with the super brief and the, um, and then different uh, working with different materials and fabrics. And, uh, you know, it's been really fun being part of the, this whole exploration and being able to test this in, with my, my, uh, my teammates over at El Nino. So I go there and I take prototypes and let them try on stuff, get feedback, and I keep evolving it, you know, using that human-centered design philosophy, but also rapid prototyping and learning from things that we've tried and learning, you know, like if something doesn't work, we just build it again. And, uh, and we've been able to refine these and, be, and make some really high-quality products that I'm super proud of and it's been fun being part of the diamond team and being able to push this product in, in a sport that I really love uh, in combat sports or athletics in general and I use my compression briefs when I go out for a run or lifting weights I wear my 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 jock strap when I'm doing the Muay Thai I like to wear the compression briefs or the competition short when I do jiu-jitsu grappling so I, I, I they, they all might seem like similar products to uh to someone who doesn't train, but when you're training and you're with different, different sports and different positions and you want to have a certain amount of flexibility or protection, those sports, the, these products are doing that, you know, on, on this level of different training. Cool. Well, thanks. We're going to, um, we're going to, we're going to get some discount codes and, and um, share some other information with our viewers so they can pick up these products. It was really cool learning about you. We're going to do another show soon. And, um, yeah, keep, uh, keep uh, fighting this stuff and staying healthy. And uh, hopefully life will get back uh, to normal real soon. And we'll talk to you again. Cool. Thanks for having me. Peace from the West Coast. Talk to you later. Thanks.